we in the Episcopal Church uh, participate in using the revised common lectionary, which many branches of uh, Christianity do, so that on any given Sunday, uh, Christians around the world and all different uh, mainline denominations are hearing the same scripture read, uh, readings read. Uh, that's what a lectionary does. It assigns the readings for that day. And there's some great um, strengths to that. One is that, that we all know what we're doing and we're, and we're focusing on the same thing on a given day. Uh, the other thing is that it helps us to um, systematically uh, move through a great deal of scripture rather than always just choosing, uh, having the pastor choose the passages that he likes uh, and ignoring all the rest. We get them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and, um, and another, uh, strength is that it, it breaks, uh, the readings up, uh, into manageable, um, pericopes is what we call them, little segments of scripture that we can ruminate on, that a preacher can preach on and, and hold it all, all together. And, we are, by the way, this year we're in year A, so we are moving our way through uh, in our gospel readings, the gospel according to Matthew. I don't know if you've noticed that, but ever since uh, last Advent, uh, most of our gospel readings are from Matthew, and often we're just going um, straight through the gospel, especially in these summer months. There are some downsides to it, though, and one is that in such an episodic approach, we often lose sight of how what we're hearing on a given Sunday fits in with the rest of the gospel, of the sweeping uh, themes that are occurring uh, and, and being replayed time and time again. We sort of forget them. Uh, and then on the other hand, we often miss out on the, the big um, surprises, the things that, that shock us. And I think that's what we're presented with this morning uh, in this reading. When we hear Jesus say to Peter, get behind me, Satan, that famous phrase. Um, it's sort of a surprising thing probably to us normally, just because we think of St. Peter as a pretty good guy, uh, and why would Jesus equate him with the devil? Um, but it's even more surprising if we remember what we heard in last Sunday's gospel, because this story is, it, it's all the same story. It just, the, the lectionary just chopped it in two. We're in the same story that we had last week. And some of you may not have been here and others may have been here and thinking, what, what was that gospel last week? Let me tell you, Jesus was with his disciples and he asked them who people were saying that he, he was. And they said, well, some say John the Baptist come back to life and others, Elijah or one of the prophets. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts out, you are the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, gold star for you. Come to the head of the class. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Uh, I'm not going to call you Simon anymore. I'm going to call you Petros, which is the Greek word meaning rock. Because it's on the rock of such faith as this that I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Wow. Peter must be feeling pretty doggone good, especially since this was done in the presence of all his friends, the other disciples. And... So then Jesus immediately starts to tell them what being Messiah means. And he says he's going to go to Jerusalem and he is going to suffer. And in fact, he's going to be put to death. It's like, time out. Peter is not having any of this. Because Peter, along with most people at the time who were looking for Messiah, were looking for something, or something very specific a military leader to restore the kingdom to Israel. That's what this whole son of David thing is all about. David was the greatest king Israel ever had. And remember, they are now under occupation by the Roman Empire. So the Messiah will come and make Israel great again and restore the throne of David and will sit upon it and rule. No suffering, no being put to death. That's not part of it. So Peter sort of 
full of himself after that gold star, uh, pulls Jesus aside. And he literally gets in his face. And he says, you don't know what you're talking about. That will never happen to you. Listen to me. And then Jesus says this striking thing that's just become cliche almost with us and uh, get behind me, Satan. But that packs a big punch in those few words. First, he says, get behind me, which is a, 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 an acknowledgement of how Peter has forgotten who and what he is, which is a disciple of Christ. A disciple is one who follows, not one who stands and gets in your face. So the first of all, Peter needs to be reminded to come behind Jesus, to follow Jesus. And then Satan, and we, we, we think that's pretty harsh, but Satan again is a word that has a meaning. It means adversary or tempter. And when I, when I heard this, I was, uh, I was reminded of that um, great, uh, well, I didn't think it was that great particularly. It won a lot of awards, I think, but the film by Martin Scorsese on Kazantzakis' Last Temptation of Christ. I think it came out in the late 80s. Um, and e even though there were things about the film I didn't care for, there was one scene in it that I thought was brilliant. And it wasn't the last temptation of Christ, if you're familiar, the last temptation happens on the cross. It was the, how he presented the first temptation of Christ. When Jesus goes out into the wilderness after his baptism and fasts for 40 days and he's completely alone. And I don't know about you all, but I, you know, I, I would say that I, when I picture that, that I picture the horned, uh, cloven hoofed, pointy tail creature tempting Jesus. But I, I do, picture like a demonic creature uh, bringing before him these temptations. And remember, there were three temptations, one for physical ease, uh, another for spiritual surety, and another for a worldly power. But Scorsese did a brilliant thing, I think, in that the way he presented it was not through any kind of demonic creature, but Jesus's friends his disciples. One would come out, just appear out of the brush, the brush bushes or whatever was around there, the scrub brush. Peter or Mary Magdalene. And it was out of their mouths that the temptation would come. And I thought, how amazing is that? Because isn't that the way we experience temptation? I mean, how many of us encounter demonic figures that try to lead us on a path we, that God doesn't intend for us. No, we're often drawn astray by the voices we hear on television, all around us, but from our friends, even from family. And sometimes it's, it's, it's all good intentioned, but it's pulling us away. It's tempting us. And um, that's what we see here in this interchange with Peter. Peter is being an adversary for Jesus following in God's way. And he is being the tempter. And so Jesus says, get behind me, become a disciple, and stop being the tempter and the, um, the adversary. Um, and he tells Peter that you're doing this because your mind is focused on earthly things rather than divine things. Now, this doesn't mean that we are, to, we are to ignore what's going around us in the world. It's not that we're not to be involved in the things of the world, it's how we engage in the world. And um, I love uh, our presiding bishop has a phrase that uh, he uses quite often, and I think it's very arresting, uh, that we are called to replace the nightmare of this world that we have created with the dream that God intends for it. And that's, that's the kind of thing that Jesus is, is talking about. Um, the nightmare we have created, we see it all around us and we, we can plug into it um, because it's, it, it's just so easy. I mean, if you wanna further that nightmare, just start tweeting without thinking and put on all your Facebook posts that make the walls 
of uh, hostility grow larger between people. Let's unfriend anyone who disagrees with us. That's the way the world works. Let's go downtown and burn things up. Um, that is earthly focus. And the divine focus then is the things that are desired to further this dream of God. And what are they, these desired things? Well, you know, it brought to my mind a, a little phrase that this is really gonna date me. Uh, there's, a, there's a foreign word, a Latin word for desired things. It's called desiderata. And uh, I'm gonna switch to gallery view here. Raise your hand if you are of a certain generation, though I certainly am, and can remember back to the early 70s of a song. It was a spoken song, but it had a sort of a sung refrain called Desiderata, and it was played all the time. Anybody remember that? Just raise your hand if you, uh, if you remember it. Oh, I'm not seeing that many people remember that. It was, it was quite, quite popular, Desiderata. You can Google it. Um, let's see. There we are. Um, well, since you don't remember it, and even if you do, you probably haven't heard it in a long, long time. And uh, I want to share it with you. Um, it was written by uh, Max er um, Ehrman back in 1927. But as I said, it wasn't, uh, it didn't become really, really popular for most of us until the, I think it was the early 70s when this recording came out. And uh, it was unique because most of it was spoken, uh, and, but it, it was like a top hit. Go placidly amid the noise and the haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant. They too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexatious to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you will become vain or bitter. For always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs for the world is full of trickery, but let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection, neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. Do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive God to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace in your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. Desiderata, the desired things. Unfortunately, here we are almost 50 years later. Uh, having to be reminded of those sentiments, even though they played on our airwaves air time and time again. But in terms of today's scripture, I am, uh, feel so thankful to have this story 
that uh, link together the two stories of Peter uh, because it's a mirror for us. It's a mirror for me, at least. A great reminder that, yep, you know, there are times when I get it. There are times when I just feel at one with the universe, a child of the universe, at one with God. I see the picture, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God, and I get the gold star and go to the head of the class. And in the next minute, I become the adversary. And I say, this is not the way it's going to be, God, because I know what I'm talking about and you don't. And I forget to be a disciple and a follower. And in those moments, I might hear Christ saying some harsh sounding words, but they're said to me in love. You notice Jesus never unfriended Peter. <laughs> he called him lovingly to get behind him, to be his disciple, to follow him, and then to walk in the way of suffering love with him in following the desiderata. And that desiderata, if you had noticed, it wasn't invented in that 1970s recording. It wasn't come up with by Max Ehrman in 1927. In fact, it was originally stated by the Apostle Paul as he wrote, to the Romans. And I'd like to end with what we heard, the desiderata of our own scripture, the desired things. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the way that we follow our Lord. It's the way that we protect ourselves from becoming stumbling blocks and adversaries. And it's the way we work towards replacing the nightmare we have created around us with the dream that God intends. Amen.